The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to the April NPMA Spotlight webinar. My name is Scott Ray and I am the NPMA Vice President of Seminars and Events. And I, I just wanted to take a few seconds to welcome you into today's session. Today we're, today's topic is an interesting topic on how modern technology is transforming government property management. Um, before I welcome in our speakers today, I just wanted to touch on a few housekeeping items. Uh, the first um, of which is the fact that you can uh, send us questions. Uh, all questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the presentation, um, but there should be a question box uh, right there in the little uh, little or the little side panel application thing um, where you can type in any questions you have. So go ahead and send those in. Um, and we will uh, address those at the conclusion. If we do run out of time, what we'll do is take those questions and then we will pro uh, provide it to our speakers and they'll respond uh, post, post meetings. Um, with that said, I'd like to welcome in Alex Michelson of Baker Tilly and Peter Collins of A to B Tracking to present on how modern technology is transforming government property management. Gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome in. Thank you for doing this presentation, and I will turn it over to you. All right, Th thanks, Scott. Um, thanks everyone for uh, uh, joining uh, Peter and myself here for uh, another chat. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, um, Alex Michaels, I'm a senior manager with the uh, Baker Tilly's Government Contract Solutions Practice. Uh, we do all sorts of uh, support for government contractors on the government contract compliance front, indirect rates, business systems, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Myself, I have a unique uh, specialty in the practice that I work with government property. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we have a lot of content to get through here. Uh, Dave, I think if you can go back one or two slides here. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll have a lot, a lot of content to get through here. Uh, I'll let Peter introduce in a second, but uh, you know, one of the things that Peter and I always talk about, right, is there's modern technology and there's compliance requirements. And so I think we're gonna try and, uh, bridge the gap here and, and talk about how we can better look at some of those um, throughout the presentation here. So, uh, Peter, I'll let you do a quick intro and then we can just jump right in. Yeah, Peter Collins here. Um, many of you uh, know me from doing uh, NPMA uh, presentations at NES. I'm the CEO here at A to B. Uh, we develop at A to B tracking government property management systems with a focus on automation. And so uh, we've implemented systems across all areas of, of federal government um, and track many assets and inventory on a worldwide scale. Now, yeah, I agree with Alex. We're, we're here to look at multiple sides of the cube, as I like to call it, where I'm, I'm focused more on the technology side I'll be speaking to, to record keeping, compliance, automation, where Alex is going to be focusing on uh, policies and procedures. So let's get into it. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, some basic requirements for internal controls and policies and procedures, just to sort of lay, lay the framework on how we think about compliance when it comes to government property management. Uh, we'll segue into some what some of the modern technologies are that are out there, and uh, Peter's going to talk to us about that. Now we have a handful of uh, select FAR 52245-1 property outcomes that we wanted to cover and sort of like I mentioned, bridge that gap and really pull the modern technology aspect together with what's, uh, what, what the compliance requirements are and get us thinking about, right, we, we look at modern technology for, uh, from perspective of you know, making us more efficient, uh, potentially reducing the costs. And I think what, what, I, what, what I'd like for you guys to take away from this is, well, how can we add in another layer and actually help allow modern technology to help us be more compliant with things? And then uh, last final slide here that I always love is, right, we're, we're talking about government property and government property management system, but really it's a lot broader than that because all the business systems are interconnected. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. All right, so let's talk about what, what is a business system that we think about. Uh, a lot of times we're thinking it's, you know, it, it's a software tool, it's a software application. That's what we usually refer to as a system. 
But in the context of a business system of how we're looking at when it, whether it be government property, accounting, estimating, uh, purchasing, it, it's a little bit more than just the IT software package. We're looking at you know what our business does, our business cycles. What what are the inputs? What are the outputs? What are uh, you know think of think of uh, in in the context of government property? What are those outcomes and processes throughout the life cycle? Uh, our policies and procedures, which is going to be key throughout what we talk about. What is it that we say we do versus the next box here, processes and controls? What are we actually doing? Right? Do we have do we have uh, alignment and synergy between the two of those, or do we have what I like to refer to as self-inflicted wounds? Um, we're looking at the people, who's involved, right? Who's doing uh, the, the reviews and approvals? Uh, who's entering data? Who's responsible for moving stuff down the line or receiving acceptance? Uh, the big green box here, and then this is where a lot of the technology aspect comes in, is really what is the software? What is it, you know, uh, is there any automation that we use? What are those tools that help us, you know, manage and accomplish and run this entire system? And then lastly, uh, how do we monitor and evaluate, right? How do we look at what is it that we're, doing how well are we doing and when you look at all the, these things there's a common thread throughout because there's going to be systems of internal controls there are going to be things that we say or we do that helps us to make sure that this business system and all these cycles the the, the gears sort of keep turning and nothing really breaks and so I want to talk a little bit about what is the concept of an internal control so ne next slide here so uh Internal control is kind of one of those things we all sort of know what it is, but we have, you know, when you when you take a step back and you actually think about what its purpose is and what it actually does, I think it starts to actually make a little bit more sense. Um, so, if the place I always want to start with looking at internal controls is what is the requirement? What do the laws and the regulations say that we have to do? Right. Uh, uh, we have to meet the outcomes. We have to do this sort of reporting. Laws, regulations say that we have to do this. Um, company goals as well, company uh, requirements would, would, would factor in here. But again, we're looking at government property, so let's look through the, the lens of 52245-1. Then you look at what are the risks that are going to prevent us from achieving those requirements, right? Uh, I, and it's important to identify those risks and itemize them and, and get as specific as, as, as we can practically because we have to address those risks. And that's where the control objective concept comes in. It's like, what is that high level goal um, that our internal controls ultimately, we'll get to in a second, need to address? So you think about your risks, the flip side of that are your control objectives. And those often manifest themselves in, you can think of them as almost policy statements in your policies and procedures, right? Uh, we're gonna report all losses. We're gonna uh, receive all property within X amount of days or something like that. The, the broad, these broader policy statements that then cause you to go to the next level and say, well, how are we doing that? And that's where our internal controls come in is the how. It's the processes, the activities, the safeguards uh, in place designed to address the control objectives. So as you're looking at your inventory of internal controls of what, what we're doing in, in our property system, you should be able to trace it all the way back to what is that requirement that it addresses. And if you're so confused, let's look at a practical example on the next slide here, um, uh, j j j just, just so we can uh, get a little more, a bit more down to earth and out of that, that uh, ambiguous white space. So using the example of, of losses here, and we got a couple of swim lanes here. We'll just go through the, the blue swim lane, just to give that example, how we go from requirement all the way internal controls. So requirement for losses, unless otherwise directed property by the property administrator, the contractor shall investigate and report to the government all incidents of property loss as soon as the facts become known. That's our requirement. So what's one of our risks? Well, potential losses aren't identified internally, right? We don't even know when we have a loss. That, that's one of our risks. There's a few others here, but we, we won't go through all those. Um, control objective to sort of address that risk is potential losses will be reported to our government property manager for investigation. Control objective addresses that risk. Question it then becomes how. So let's look at our, some of our internal controls. Personnel are required to report potential losses to the government property manager within 48 hours of identification. Um, it's important. So there's there's somebody that, that's involved in the process. There's a time frame. There's things that we can measure to see if it's actually working, if it's, ha if it's happening. And then the next one here is uh, we use form CC123 uh, is prepared and reviewed by the employee supervisor as, as part of the reporting process. So another control and even a key supporting document uh, that uh, that goes with this process. Again, you can take each one of these, trace it all the way back to the requirement. 
Um, now, we can have a very, very long list of, of internal controls. Um, what we want to focus in are going to be those key controls. And the, the easiest way I, I, I tend to think about those is if you picture a Jenga tower, that's all our internal controls. When we pull out that one piece that causes the whole tower to crash, those are the important ones. That's really what we want to focus in on when we're thinking self-assessments and testing things. All right, uh, let's go ahead to the next slide here. Um, so, well, I'll intro, do a quick intro to some of the modern technology and Peter can, can take us through. But uh, we, we, we've seen sort of, uh, some of us in our lifetimes, in our careers, some of us maybe are picking up on the tail end here, but we've seen we've gone from paper tracking of, you know, inventories, uh, receiving documents, all that stuff. Sometimes we still have some of those. We've gone into spreadsheet tracking. Now we're moving into automation and, and maybe some AI and, and, and whatnot. Uh, and all this makes us better at, at our jobs, makes us more efficient. Uh, I know, Peter, you like to use the term swivel chair a lot. Uh, it, it helps reduce that. Uh, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't allow us to kick back and relax. And, and as we talk through some of these modern technologies and we go, go through the outcomes, right, think about it makes us better, it makes us more efficient, but how is it making us also more compliant? And what do we need to include in our policies and procedures and description of things that we do? Uh, that helps tell a better story of how our government property system is operating. Uh, Peter, anything to add before we turn over? It's a, it's a perfect segue though into not only the document on the policy and procedures, but of course the record keeping that has to support yep. all of those process and policy and procedures you just explained. You know, which, which I love your sort of diagram here of the Cro-Magnon man, right, the evolution. Uh, because that's the way we see it too. Um, if you go to the next slide, Dave, you know, we, we can see that the way A to B tracking looks at modern government property management system technologies. This is not some theoretical or future state. This is what is today. This is what is now. And there are some fundamental building blocks that help to shape out what you need as a contractor supporting the government or the federal government yourselves and how you go ahead and have that continuity have that accuracy in terms of the way you're doing your record keeping today so we always start with having what we call the single pot of truth and that is a centralized single database that all information can feed into and get vetted according to what exactly is happening out in the physical world we, we know that as book to floor and floor to book accounting, making sure that our records match what's physically there and that what's physically there accurately is depicted in the record keeping. So this is all about that end goal in support of this broader compliance of what do I have? Where are my assets? What physical inventory do I have? And how am I recording and tracking it through all of its stages of its life cycle? So centralized, a single database of tracking that can handle not only the detail of that inventory or the pedigree, but also transactions against that so that you know when something moves, who moved it and where it went, or when you know that you updated a record, who updated that record and when. Those kinds of transactional details that are auditable against this need. Also secure. Of course, we know IT compliance is a big topic with cybersecurity these days. We've got to make sure that everything that you maintain is also within a secure cloud or securely inside your firewall, it, acknowledging all those controlled and classified information obligations, or if you're in more classified or sensitive areas, how you're doing that. Accessibility, that's another one where again today we've got modern technologies you know along the cro magnon continuum like you got smartphones at play here you've got tablet computers we've got desktops and laptops there's a number of ways in which we can capture data efficiently and improve that accuracy and keep the record keeping up to date in this in its simplest form so that come the audit time you got everything you need we'll talk a little bit about that of course, automation. That's really where we, it's our near and dear to us at ADB Tracking. We're talking about the use of auto ID technologies. A lot of us know that in the form of just a barcode, but also going beyond that with some use of RFID. Doesn't matter which you use in the end, 
leveraging one of those is going to save you time and improve your accuracy. We'll talk more about how that comes about in support of your obligations. And automation in terms of data exchange, right? To Alex's point, avoid that swivel chair in the siloed database where it's not talking to other systems, including these government systems that need your data because they need to satisfy their obligations in order to communicate through to Congress or wherever they need to uh, justify what they have, where it is, and how it's accounted for. And then also integrate it into your ERP system or whatever your system of record is inside your, your organization. It could be in the warehouse, it could be tracking items in a manufacturing facility, government property that is across ge geographically separated locations, whatever the case may be, but all of these represent the fundamentals. And I got to add what this is not for modern technology. When we look at it, we recognize it is not spreadsheets. And I know Alex and I talk about this. We debate on occasion whether the spreadsheet is adequate, but I'll tell you that when it comes to the capabilities we're going to talk about today to make you more efficient and more accurate, spreadsheets is not that. It's not that. So, uh, that's why we say accountable uh, property systems are not spreadsheets. We'll, we'll get into that. Next one. Sometimes automation does come in the form of different environments and how you apply the technology. We'll touch a little bit about, um, you know, today, like, it's really amazing how fast uh, now the adoption of RFID is being perceived and how it can actually be implemented in a way that's meaningful. You've got office areas, what we'll call the carpeted areas of the building. You've got warehouses. You've got assembly lines or maintenance repair and overhaul facilities, all leveraging these sensor-based technologies. You might even go so far as calling it one thread of an internet of things in the way that it gets implemented in a secure way where you can track items moving last known location of when physical assets are being moved or inventory is being accounted for. You certainly have mobility. You don't need me to tell you that. It's all in our back pockets these days. But the way you apply mobility in the use of providing and supporting certain functions. And then you can even take it so far as autonomous mobile robots. And we even have worked with that in certain warehouse environments where it can do continuous cycle counts, literally without any human involvement, where using RFID, you can have these robots counting continuously. Next one. Which takes us to the outcomes. Yep. Yeah, let's go ahead to the next one. All right, so we're gonna look at uh, four of the select outcomes. We'll look through receiving uh, physical inventory reports and movement. Hopefully we'll have enough time to uh, get through all of these. Uh, but again, looking at it through what's required, what's the compliance requirements there. Peter will take us through some of the modern technology. And we'll, we'll, we, again, we want to bridge that gap and, and, and look at how we actually, uh, the modern technology can be part of our compliance environment as well. So let's jump into receiving. So receiving involves four processes. Uh, we're going to do a physical receipt of the property. We're going to document the receipt. We're going to manage discrepancies. Uh, you know, we ordered uh, red widgets. We got blue widgets. We ordered five. We got four. Um, and then it sort of ends with uh, identifying the property as uh, government owned. And as you look throughout the, the, the this, these processes, right, th think back through that technology continuum, right? We went uh, paper-based to uh, spreadsheet-based to some sort of uh, automation. And, and, and that sort of exists in, in the receiving process. And I'd argue to say it probably exists in many of those forms, if not all of those forms, simultaneously as part of the, the receiving process. Think about what we do for physical receipt, right? We get the property, somebody probably signs for it, or or we, the, the vendor has us sign, or maybe we have some sort of barcoded technology, we scan it in, we document the receipt, right? That can take ma many ways. So we take the PO, we compare it against the receiving and shipping documents, and that needs to be filed away, it needs to be available for, for records access. Uh, uh, manage uh, discrepancies incident to shipment, well, that's, you know, you get an Amazon package that came in the wrong way. You're gonna you're gonna call them and and tell them that we we didn't get the same thing. Um, so what's our process for for handling that? And then finally identifying properties government owned. Usually slapping a sticker on it, putting it on the shelf, whatever it is, but making sure it's identified uh, 
as government owned. So our procedures need to describe each of these elements. We need to think about what it is we're actually doing on the ground. And if we have some of these modern solutions that Peter's gonna talk about in a second, how do we work those into our procedures, right? And, and, and leverage some of that automation, leverage some of that uh, digital uh, technology and the systems talking to each other uh, to actually highlight some of those, autonom uh, those automated controls versus things that we would in the old way do manually, right? So Peter, why don't you take us through some of those? Sure. Yeah, let's talk about um, modern receiving, right? So either something was triggered by a PO or maybe a GFP attachment, uh, defining what's due in. Uh, the receipt and reconcile uh, has to happen, just like you stated, Alex. And uh, you know, this could be government property um, or it could be materials coming in. Um, you know, but in the end, you know, we have to turn this into something meaningful that we can track and we can account for as inventory. So if you go to the next slide, Dave, I like to kind of use this example, cost point receiving. A lot of companies uh, use cost point um, today and they use the receiving capability as products are received in, you know, cost point knows to receive it as a line item detail against what was procured. Um, you know, the, the data elements may already be identified in, in the record. You can leverage that. You can leverage that for your benefit downstream as someone who's accepting some level of responsibility with the record keeping part of the as aspect. Um, so also records get updated as necessary and discrepancies and partial shipments, you know, can, can also uh, be addressed here in this particular instance. And I'll show you some examples in just a moment. Um, but once you receive these GFE records in, you, ex you can exchange them directly with A to B tracking government property management system. Now it can perform, once you get these records into the system, it can perform some functions that you in fact need to spend a lot of attention to detail to getting right, but also in a very automated way generating and recording your IUIDs, you may need to create against those records. Performing physical inventories or cycle counts, however you manage it, reporting directly to the PI system. So once you get this data in, now you can make it actionable um, within the system. So if you go to the next one, Dave. So in this case, we just use a quick illustration. Imagine on the upper left corner, you've got a GFP attachment. You've got all your line items. Some of them are serialized. You've got your non-serialized. As, uh, as the system allows, you can then take this data and instead of actually going in and manually entering it, you can take this data and you can save it as a template which is actually being mapped into the system where it needs to be provided into basically a, a relational database. And again, relational database, very, very different from a spreadsheet in the way that the data is managed and handled with a lot more controls and a lot more you know, auditable transactions that let you go back and see what was done. But simply map it once, and now anytime you go to import an attachment, now you have these maps at the ready so that they, they actually get led and imported directly into a system that you can really start to build as your system of record. Dave, if you go to the next one. We also have um, here an illustration of an API data exchange. So for anybody who doesn't know API, it's understandable. Um, it's an application programming interface that lets two systems talk to each other. And it's not a one-way discussion, it's a two-way discussion. So that in this case, if CostPoint has received in items coming in with a description and an asset number assigned to it, that data can be now fed using an API with total automation behind the scenes, no clicking uh, or uploading or downloading on your part at all. The two systems just speak to each other using this API and working with um, your teams if you're not using CostPoint, uh, other modern systems have this API capability. So again, they can feed directly into your government property management system of record. Now, when you go to perform functions on behalf of your property system, 
and you update these records, these transactions, it might be that you put RFID in and now you've got updated locations with, with much better fidelity and regularity, that data will just flow right back to your system of record. So now you have two systems in sync and you didn't have to lift a finger in order to make these systems um, exchange data in that capacity, uh, knowing that you've lined up the right fields, the right information. Next one, Dave. All right, uh, before we get into, into the identification, I just wanted to highlight, Peter, you know, the, what the, the, the process flows you, ha you had on, uh, on the screen about how, you know, uh, information moves. Uh, really, that concept, if that's what you're using as a contractor, it's okay to include that in your policy and procedure, because guess what? A lot of that happens in an automated fashion. You, you, you kind of get away from saying, well, J Jim's going to go out, he's going to you know, pull all the paperwork, then he's going to sit there manually enter records and create records. Because the whole the whole aspect of the receiving process is we're going to create a record um, that's going to be uh, uh, that we're going to keep through the life cycle of the item. So all that, as much as that is as automated, right? We need to be able to capture that process in our policies and procedures. We need to speak to that, right? Who's going to go in and and, and reconcile that, or what point do, do certain things happen? But it doesn't necessarily have to be. Jim sitting there and entering data, right? We need to capture what, what our process actually is on the ground. Uh, next item here was, this was the last pa uh, part of that uh, receiving process was identification. Uh, to identify uh, as the property as government owned in a manner appropriate to the type of property, stamp, tag, mark, or other identification. Notice it doesn't say slap a barcode on it. Notice it doesn't say slap a sticker on it. Um, there's lots of different ways and depending on the type of property uh, and what you, what you manage, uh, there's different ways to identify it. I've seen property sitting on a shelf and the entire shelf is marked government owned or entire room, everything inside here is government owned. Um, again, making sure we, I, we know what, uh, what's appropriate. If we have different types of markings that we use, let's capture those in our policies and procedures. Let's explain some of the differences. Um, and then if we have some of the uh, enhanced technologies that, that Peter's gonna talk to us for a second, uh, in a second rather, Let's capture how we use that, uh, you know, what, what we capture on our barcodes. Peter's going to talk to us a little bit about RFID. Let's capture what those RFID tags do for us um, in, in, in uh, helping us be good stewards of government property and manage it throughout the life cycle. So, Peter, I think you're up next here. Yeah, well, so perfect, uh, you know, segue into with identification, we talk about often beginning with the end in mind. Because to put identification on means to think downstream through these life cycle events, through my obligations under contract, these are the things that I need to do. And so with the slide, I'm beginning with the end in mind. And I'm going back up to say you, you can have existing barcodes that are coming in on items that represent that particular asset because it's got a unique linear barcode assigned to it. Maybe it's actually a barcode representing a part and you've got some quantities associated to it, so both in the serialized and non-serialized. Also, you may see that items are coming in with IUIDs or two-dimensional barcodes on it, and perhaps even RFID now, as we may see more in the marketplace. But there's a couple key questions you gotta be asking yourself. So what is your obligation under contract? And also, not only that, but what, supports the most effective audit readiness and operational efficiencies for you as an organization. So under contract, it may say you got to do IUID. Any, you got to apply a two-dimensional barcode to any asset that you take responsibility for. It also could be that, um, you know, when you think about efficiencies, you may add some RFID into it because now you know, okay, whenever I'm tracking items in and out of the warehouse, as these assemblies are getting made up into final end items, I, I need to be able to track that process much more efficiently. So you can actually couple a few of these technologies together and it, it doesn't sound insane to do so. It actually is a very relevant strategy to couple barcode and RFID together based on the process that you wanna implement. But think about your downstream process and that will oftentimes dictate what auto ID technology. Next one, Dave. So 
we know we can generate linear barcodes, we can print them out, we can get them pre-printed, we can do the same for 2D barcodes as well. We just need the, to know on the 2D barcode what data to encode to make up that unique global identifier called an IUID. And then the same is true on the RFID tag. What's important here is to make sure that whatever gets generated gets tagged and applied to the specific asset and gets commissioned in the system. So now you're actually linking that barcode or RFID license plate or number up to the record itself. And when you've done that, you've really enabled so much automation downstream by making just taking that one simple step. You know you've got to identify it anyway, so you might as well leverage something that will help you downstream. And, and now you can start performing functions with that. Next one, Dave. So one example of the downstream benefits I like to use, which is a, you know what I'll call a big eye opener for a lot of organizations, is when they start using RFID to identify, let's say in this case, serialized, even non-serialized assets. When items sometimes, we work a lot in laboratories and engineering and scientific environments, we work in manufacturing environments, and what we see is things grow legs. And so it could be that it's inventory that disappeared off the shelf, could be just that a tool or a gauge or something moved from one location to another without anyone knowing it. So how do we, lo how do we actually save time in finding that kind of an item? When identified with RFID, the RF signal emits from a handheld reader and allows someone to use a feature called ProLocate to go find that item using the RF signal. And that RF signal will project out you know, 10, 20 feet to where an area allows them to walk through using the RF signal. Once that RF tag is picked up, whether it's inside a container possibly or sitting somewhere, obstructed behind a desk or on a shelf, it'll pick it up and the unit itself will tell you how close or how far you are away from that particular item. It'll do that hot, cold thing like when we were kids saying hot, 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 cold, 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 as you got closer and further away from the item. And it's a really amazing tool to save a tremendous amount of time letting you find that needle in the haystack for items that are, are left out of sight or just moved to a different location. I mean, we, we hear amazing feedback like this has saved us just many, many uh, person hours having to hunt down and find anything in particular and keeps the process moving on people doing their jobs. Next one, Dave. All right. Um, great segue off of that last piece is uh, into uh, physical inventory. So let, let's jump right in. So uh, the requirement in FAR 52245-1 for physical inventory is very broad. Contractor shall periodically perform, record, and disclose physical inventory results. That, 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 that's it, right? Uh, and there's lots of different ways to how we can conduct physical inventories. We can uh, go out, you know, do wall-to-wall -wall, uh, counts and, uh, uh, you know, put a sign on the door that says, hey, we're closed for inventory. Uh, probably in the, it, looking back through the, uh, through the technology spectrum, probably back in the paper days, that's how it's done. But it's, it's still being done a lot of times. You'll go to... Uh, jewelry stores. Uh, uh, I know uh, Tom Ruck Dashiell uh, likes to use that example quite often. Jewelry store down the road would close three times a day for inventory, uh, or they would at least do inventory three times a day. You can do cycle counts. Uh, you can do inventory by exception, right? For those of us that, are, that do, um, you know, for example, we have uh, Humvees that are government property, and every time we go and do maintenance on them, uh, we're touching them. Somebody's touching them. Somebody's physically verified that the item's there there's ways of doing that uh, and uh, using that as a um, as an inventory method uh, but the goal the goal with the requirement really is to for us to identify how we do how we intend to do physical inventories we put together summary level conclusions you know we found everything we found everything but XYZ uh, we talk about uh, who did the inventory the start and stop points um, and, and any other sort of information that might be required uh, in in the contract that that's sort of the the, the deliverable. Um, what Peter's going to talk to about us, uh, talk to us about rather, uh, and he already did in, in one form or another, right, with the hot and cold and the, and, and the scanners, the, the different ways that you can do some of those uh, RFID and, and automation uh, to find stuff. Uh, what I want you guys to think about is if, if we're going to be implementing some of this, 
we need to capture that and describe if we're going to use those as inventory methods we need to describe how that works um, how often that's going to be done what's the information we use um, as part of our self-assessment right maybe we will go out and physically touch things make sure barcodes and things are still are still okay so capturing that aspect of it it's great to be able to go out and find something that we can't find but let's go a step further and let's build that into our compliance environment and into our procedures and ultimately have a stronger system for it for it yeah that's perfect i mean and and then it comes down to how do you implement it uh in the next slide here um, whether you you choose to use a barcode methodology or an RFID and and you have to start to think about okay at what level of the um, container or the item or the inventory am I responsible for or do I want to track when you start going down this path are you looking for unit level tracking or are you looking for case level are you looking to track the container as a kit with items inside the kit uh, and in some cases, the RFID tag that you choose is going to make a difference based on if you're putting it on metal or on you know polycarbonate surface of some kind. But all these are have very distinct answers associated to them. So think about the level of accounting you're looking for, um, and and then also think about how you want that to relate back to the functions that you need to perform. Counting inventory is cumbersome. It requires a lot of attention to detail, and it's frankly something nobody really wants to do, if we're being really honest. So go down one more slide. So in this particular case, the use of mobility comes into play nicely, where, remember, we already put barcodes on all these at the identification stage of items being receded in, recorded as part of our procedure, and then it flows into the mobile computer. Immediately, you've got access in a handheld device with a built-in barcode scanner without doing anything, no docks or cradles involved. You just grab the scanner and you start walking up to items. You identify, you can identify the location you're going into so that every time you scan an item, you get the date and the timestamp recording exactly what's going on. So if you have an inventory database of 2,000 items, but you walk into that one room that's only 15 items in that particular location, you, can, you know what 15 items you're looking for. You can scan them as you find these barcodes on these items. And then you can see instantly, you can see the reconciliation that takes place before your very eyes, and you can act on that information. So now you're really creating the record keeping in your creating that transaction at the point of in, right inside uh, up close to the physical item. Next one, Dave. And that takes us to really this auditable history that you see here, where on the left-hand side under activity of a particular item, you can see moves that have taken place by the people that have done them, when they took place with a date and a timestamp of just a pull of a barcode trigger, and then any further details that might be information that's helpful to know about all the transaction history. That is the key to a relational database that supports your government property management system obligations. Next one, Dave. And we can also take that even a step further, and it will allow us to even more efficiently capture data and record that similar kind of information. This is where I use the analogy if you're fishing out in a rowboat and you've got one pole and you've got that pole in the water and you're trying to catch one fish at a time, that's really like the barcode, one-to-one -one relationship. You're just trying to capture one fish. But if you introduce it RFID to that same analogy, you're in the rowboat, you're casting your net, and that net's pulling in a couple dozen fish into the boat at the same time, that's RFID. You're able to capture sometimes dozens within one pull of a trigger and updating all of that record keeping in the locationing about where you are as you're performing that transaction. So pretty awesome stuff that can save a tremendous amount of time. Um, we actually call it the 30 to one return. You can actually perform functions 30 times um, as efficiently as if you were to do it manually. So something that might take a month to do say a physical inventory wall to wall, it could take a day or two using RFID. Next. 
Hey, Peter, would, uh, would the automated robot be the equivalent of fishing with a stick of dynamite then? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as long as you're far enough away from it and uh, you let the robot do the, yeah, the lighting of that process. Yeah. Uh, that, that's, they start jumping in your boat at that point, Alex, you know. <laughs> um, so, so that takes us to mobile computers, barcode and RFID. You know, these industrial kind of computers that are, are more um, uh, designed for these kind of warehouse environments, field environments, where you have to go out and, uh, you know, work in remote areas for capturing updates of inventory, all connected through to the cloud. You know, this is all part of the design. These things are, are actually um, about the same price of a, of a smartphone these days, but they're, they're nice and rugged for these, built for these uh, environments specifically. Next one, Dave. All right. All right. So uh, coming out of the inventories, we're going to jump into re reports. Um, you know, we'll probably have to update uh, s s uh, part of this slide. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the, um, uh, the DFARS proposed rule for consolidation of uh, property clauses in terms of where you report GFP. Uh, that's out. Um, it's a proposed rule, but uh, so, 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 some of the old databases are, you know, the language is being clear, cleaned up. Everything's going into the GFP module now, uh, pretty much, period. Uh, but uh, looking at the, the FAR clause, uh, th there's a number of uh, things that we have to report, uh, discrepancies, uh, reports of loss. We talked about loss a little bit earlier on in, in the uh, internal control example. Physical inventory results we have to report. We just talked about that. Um, results of audits and self-assessments, uh, corrective actions, and, and, and anything else really that uh, that's going to be required uh, per per the contract. And some of these reports you really can't get away from just, you know, they, they could be really unique or, uh, you know, a result of a self-assessment. There's not a lot to automate there, uh, but there are, you know, uh, standard report reporting that like receiving, we talked about earlier on, right? Receiving GFP, um, reporting that out to the GFP module or deliveries of, 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 of government property, of, you know, reporting that through the GFP module as well. Reporting losses that, that you know, th th those are sort of standardized types of reports uh, that, that we're gonna be dealing with. And, you know, I've seen policies and procedures where, uh, sometimes there's a time frame in there, sometimes there isn't, but it's usually handled sort of on a one-to-one. -one. Um, and if that's how we do it and we have, you know, low volume, that's probably fine. But if we have larger volumes worth of data um, and we're using some of these automated tools that Peter's going to talk to us about um, in, in a minute, um, again, let's, let's think about, right, we're not just eliminating the swivel chair going from system to system, but we're at, there's actually some, some automation, uh, in there of where, you know, somebody clicks the button and Peter knows this technical stuff a lot better, but better than I do. And automatically stuff gets uploaded, you know, maybe we need to figure out how often we click that button. Uh, but it, it, it eliminates the, you know, the individual having to go ahead and manually uh, enter a lot of these things. And again, this is something, this is a process that we want to capture in our policies and procedures. Again, uh, being an auto, more of an automated type of control, it should, it, we, um, automated control sometimes are, are difficult or challenging sometimes for reviewers to understand that haven't been intimately involved in the system. So it's it's important to describe what actually happens and how we how we we do that uh, but from an automated perspective taking out a large portion of that human element uh, should give reviewers uh, of your uh, property management system a little bit more comfort uh, with how things are operating so again as we as we talk through what happens when the, when the modern technology world with reports think about how we capture that how we record that in our policies and procedures yeah, I mean, and so once you've got that record keeping where you need it inside a government property system, Alex, you now have the ability to generate these reports upon a click, right? So, Dave, if you go to the next slide, we're talking about physical inventory results. You know, how do you, what, how about aging report? Can you see how long it's been since you've last inventoried these items? How about identifying any discrepancies or loss items that can easily be one click away, IUIDs that have been generated under this obligation. Uh, you can take any of this data too and you can export it out of a government property management system 
into a spreadsheet and you can manipulate it further if you feel like you want to do some kind of specialized reporting against it. Next one, Dave. What we really like to see in reporting too is that that data that the government needs in the GFP module can get uploaded directly into the GFP module. So you've got your property or end items going there, you've got your IUID updates, your shipments and receipts, your life cycle updates, all of that can directly connect through to these government systems. Some of you may not know much more than just the login portal you go into in order to copy paste or swivel chair this data in. These systems are designed to have a direct connect through to the government systems in the cloud. So you just click it and the data flows through to that government system. I'll show you an example of that in a moment. Dave, if you go one, one further. So imagine that you're in your government property management system, you've got a half a dozen items, you wanna to get to the GFP module. The system knows ultimately what you need to have within your pedigree in order for you to provide that to the GFP module. It won't let you submit unless you fill out all the information as needed, but you don't have to do it under duress with a timeout in the GFP module lurking or over your, you know, sort of a dark cloud over you. It, the system itself lets you go ahead and resolve those items and you can even see very much detailed about what's missing before you hit go because you don't want to submit inconsistent or data that's that's incomplete. Next one, Dave. And when you submitted it, success is really virtually immediate where you get a confirmation that you submit that it's been successfully accepted. It may not happen immediately, immediately, not like, you know, seconds later, but within some reasonable period of time after the GFP module takes it and digests that information from the direct flow, the direct connect, it will then provide you for confirmation back saying everything was entered, good to go. Next one, Dave. And Peter, before, before we jump over, and oh, yeah. what you're looking at on the screen here, you, you've now created essentially a record to, to show someone that you've actually uploaded to, uh, to, to, to the GFP module. Exactly. Yeah. Remember, if, it, if it's not documented, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. All right. Uh, let's talk about movement. Uh, movement is one of those uh, sort of... Uh, elements, uh, outcomes uh, of, of the government property system that it sort of just shows up in one word, contractors should utilize, consume, move, and store government property only as authorized under this contract. Uh, but what, what, what does that mean uh, to move, right? So th there's a little bit of a, of a spectrum, a lot bit of a spectrum here, depending on the type of property that we have. Uh, you know, we're going to look at minimal to no tracking of movement, potentially to real-time tracking as, as close as we can, uh, depending on the type of property uh, that we have, right? Our two, three-ton press, uh, I don't think it's going to grow legs. I hope it doesn't grow legs. If it did, it's an inside job. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we probably don't, don't don't need to worry about wh where that piece of equipment is uh, day to day, where it is in the building. You know, you open the door to the shop, you can see it there. Uh, tires for in this example or something a little bit more um, um, yeah. easy to carry, a little bit more portable. Uh, maybe we, we, we want to track it when it moves, you know, building to building, we need to know where it is. But then you get to something that's really sensitive. Think maybe uh, missiles, ammunition. Um, other, you know, maybe precious metals or, or things like that, if that's what's in our contract. We, we want to have, you know, near real-time visibility of, of where that is. And so there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, and we, we need to define what movement means for us, right? Is it room to room, shelf to shelf maybe, uh, building to building across our campus, state to state? It, 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 the answer is always it depends. We need we as contractors need to make sure that we define what's appropriate for us. But then we also need to uh, once we define what movement means, how do we track that? How do we demonstrate that we're tracking that sort of location? Uh, Peter talked a little bit earlier about engineers, and you know I, I, I've worked with with, with labs and um, a lot of and not, not to pick on labs, universities, and, and research and development. Uh, uh, organizations, but let's face it, engineers love to play with 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 with, with science projects, and then they'll grab whatever is off the shelf. Um, and if we're in that type of environment where we find that that stuff happens all of the time, and we can't find where this engineer took this item out, um, and you know it was never signed out or 
it was signed out but never returned. Some of these automated tools that Peter was talking about, and we'll talk about uh, uh, here in, in a second, right? Uh, that, that's a consideration to have, and it also reduces the administrative burden on both, both the property management function of tracking where this stuff is, but also reduces your the, the administrative burden on your users, right, where they don't have to go out and necessarily uh, fill out a form every single time, get a or, uh, get an approval. Uh, some of these automated tools uh, automatically will just update where, where the record is. But we need to capture in our policies and procedures that that is the process that we use to, ca uh, to capture this movement function. Uh, again, if we have different types of property, we may, we may have different classifications of movement. We need to be able to understand that. We need to be able to explain that, document that. And then ultimately, whatever technology that we use needs to sort of follow that form and function. Peter? Alex, I'm an engineer, and I don't know what you're talking about with those behaviors <laughs> you're talking about. Actually, I should say I'm a recovering engineer at this point. I'm so. a recovering auditor, so we're, we're, we're both in recovery here. <laughs> so this is where fixed reader and sensor technology can really come into play with RFID, where you've got a UHF uh, frequency as a signal that communicates to the tag. It's just a fancy way of saying these devices can get recognized as moving through particular points. Next slide, Dave. And what we can also see is that these, when you take the time to set up these RFID sensors or what we call a gateway, these are transitional readers that can actually see items that move in and out of a building or a facility inside the building, for instance. And so now you actually have a last known location strategy where you create zones and these orange arrows are where it would be logical in a, in a blueprint like this to put these kind of transition readers. Now you've created, okay, I've seen it going into the warehouse, but it didn't leave the warehouse. So now I know where to look for it, right? Or it went into the production room, but didn't leave the production room according to the database. So now I need to go where to look for it. These are always on sensors being recording uh, of movement of these RFID assets, 24 by 7, and you know you don't need to flood these areas like Wi-Fi. These are really very specific readers that focus on a certain area. And what happens, Dave, Dave in the next uh, slide here, is that you can see now these location and movement changes, and they inventory them at the same time. So you're accomplishing that inventory function, and you're seeing the movement as these items are moving from one location to another. Next one, Dave. So when you're reading RFID tags, literally these readers read tags at hundreds of tag reads per second. And so, because it needs to make sure it's capturing whatever's coming through this choke point, you now need a centralized system in which to maintain all of that RFID data. It could be that you are pushing it back to some kind of system of record. The examples we used are Costpoint or Oracle, whatever the case may be. But this is where that edge system can help you gather all this data and provide the business value to these systems. So back to you, Alex, uh, to kind of talk about interconnectedness and take it home. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dave, let's uh, jump in the last one. So you, you've heard Peter uh, mention, uh, you know, a system like Costpoint, Costpoint being an ERP. Uh, a lot of uh, contractors use that as their accounting system. There, 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 there are many others. Um, and we've already talked about some of the interconnectedness between government property system and the accounting system. There, there's more that we'll talk about in a second. But I, I want everybody to take away that all of these DFARS business systems that we talk about, they're all, they're all connected. And because they're all connected, when auditors or reviewers come in to look at any one of these systems, they may find deficiencies. Uh, and as they uh, identify these deficiencies, the government uh, government auditing standards require them to report deficiencies, even if though even though they may be outside of what uh, the subject matter of what they're looking for. So if they see something, they should say something. And so uh, looking at the government property system, the, 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 sort of, the sort of circle chart on the, on the bottom, we, we let's take a look, quick look and just understand the various touch points. These are by no means all inclusive or all encompassing, but just things to think about. So government property with purchasing system. 
it's how we handle a uh, contractor acquired property, how we handle our subcontract oversight. Uh, there, there's connection points there. I, I'd even say, you know, how we handle uh, awarding subcontracts. There's a government property aspect to it because if we're, if that subcontractor is going to be getting GFP or is going to be allowed to purchase cap, they need to have uh, adequate procedures. And what do we do as contractors to make sure that that actually happens? Um, looking at the estimating system, how do we handle excess reporting, right? There, 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 there are automated tools that will allow us to, to, to have visibility into what things may be excess because things that aren't being used, right, or being touched in, in, a, in, a, in, in a while, that goes into, uh, you know, things we want to review for reporting as access to the government. Uh, but if, if we have things in our possession that haven't been accessed, can we use them on uh, other government prop, uh, excuse me, on other government contracts, we need to disclose what GFP we have in our possession. Uh, we need to be lo looking at what what, requ what requirements are out there that come in through new solicitations, anything that we need to change about our procedures, anything new that we need to price in that's gonna be required of us. Right right now, the the inventory requirement says periodic physical inventories. If we have a contract that, that has this inventory three times a day, that's gonna be a heck of a lot more expensive. Our estimating folks need to know about that. They necessarily don't know that uh, that's what it's going to take. That's why government property needs to be involved. Uh, MMAS, uh, Material Management Accounting System, very natural link to government property. You know, material that's capped. How we how we handle excess disposition, inventorying is is, is also a part of of that system. Accounting is always the big one. If I were to draw uh, another uh, graph of uh, graphic of all the business systems, accounting system would probably be in the middle because it's the one that everything flows through. But we're a government property folks, we're gonna focus on that. Uh, but you know, how we handle uh, contract billings, adjustments and credits, right? If, if we return cap uh, back to, to vendors, we need to make sure we back those costs out. They're not charged to, uh, to the projects. What we define as material costs, uh, how, how we define direct versus indirect is gonna affect what's, what's government property is cap under a contract or what's just our uh, general inventory accounts. There's all these things that we need to be aware of. And, uh, you know, as government property folks uh, and the government property folks on, on, on the phone, uh, on the phone, on the webinar can, can, can correct me, but, you know, a lot of times, unfortunately, other aspects of our organizations view the government property function as just taking inventories. We know it's much, much broader than that. And it's up to us to really educate the rest of the organization. Make sure that when it comes to all these other aspects, all these other systems, and all these other events, you know, subcontracts or, or estimating, that we have a seat at the table to make sure that we protect our organization, address all of those risks that we've been talking about, and make sure that deficiencies in one system don't bleed over and don't affect uh, other uh, businesses. So, it's a great yeah. point, Alex. Uh, great, great community to be engaged in here at MPMA. Um, make sure everybody signs up for NES and brings their colleagues. Alex, you gonna be there? I'm gonna be there. I got two sessions. I'm gonna be there too. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. We'll take a few questions if there are any. Yep. All right. Um, we have a few questions. Um, I am going to start with the person. We've had a couple people had to dip out, but um, so I'm going to start with the person who is still here. Is there a specific property management module in Cost Point? Uh, so that's a good question. So um, assets, as by way of the definition of an asset, an inventory can be managed through uh, two different modules of Cost Point in order to connect directly through to, go to a government property management system, A to B tracking. Uh, in the UC web platform. So depending on which way in which you're managing your inventory, you're non-serialized, and then your, your assets, you're serialized, it can go through either or of those modules or both to get through to A to B, uh, should you want to do that. Okay. And I would just uh, add, Peter, that you know the in the inventory module uh, and the experience that, that I've had with Cost Point, it's it's great for managing like it like contractor inventory. It's not a property management system per se. Uh, there's workarounds and there's tools that can be uh, set up. And again, you know, highlighting it's important to capture all those workarounds and what you do in your policies and procedures. So, you know, I, I think be, be, being the unbiased uh, uh, party here to, to property management systems, have I seen it work? Yes. Is it a challenge? Yes, I've seen that be a challenge as well. 
All right. And I know cool. we have we have a hard stop. So um, I'm going to thank both of you for presenting and um, the kudos are coming in on the comments. So thank you both very much. The questions that didn't get answered, I'm going to email to you both so that you can reply directly to the people with the questions. Okay. We'll get responses out. Thank all you, right. everyone. Thanks so much. You're welcome. We'll see you all in Orlando. All right. See you in Orlando. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.